Today we're going to continue our sermon series that's called Unnamed. And today we're looking at Pharaoh's daughter. And we're going to be talking about some lessons that we have from this text that I think serve us well in this time, in this day and age. Today we'll feature the daughter of the Egyptian Pharaoh. And, and though she is a play, in a place of prominence and prestige, we still don't know her name. You know, oftentimes the unnamed ones are women, and oftentimes they are, uh, they are poor. Um, and yet this woman, the, the Egyptian princess, is unnamed. But the role that she plays and the lesson that she and this story teaches us is a very important one for our faith journey. The lesson defines God's character. And it also brings us to the heart of one of the world's richest energy sources. And that is the God action. Now let the word about God become the soil in your mind in which we plant a few thoughts this morning and hope that they come to full fruition. I'd like for us to center in on the 23rd through the 25th verses. And I want to read those one more time for us. In the course of those many days, the king of Egypt died. And the people of Egypt groaned under their bondage and cried out for help. And their cry under bondage came up to God. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel, and God knew their condition. Could more be packed into three verses than we've just read about God? This descriptive word about God's character for the Hebrew people. Let me tell you something. That's a descriptive word of God's character for you, for me. This is who God is. And it's captured here in these few verses. God loves and cares and intervenes for us always. Listen to this. The summary of these three verses. God hears. It said God heard their groaning. God remembers. God remembered the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God sees. God saw the people of Israel. And God knows. God knew their condition. Think about how all of that impacts your life personal, personally. God knows your condition. And God is there for all of us, all the time. The theme of the sermon today is in this question. When are we most like God? When are we most like God? And the obvious answer is when we act like God acts. And we're talking about hearing others, remembering who we are in relation to others, seeing others, and knowing others' circumstances. Doesn't that make sense? We are most like God when we act like God. I mean, that's pretty simple, but doesn't it make sense? So let's move in our minds with this question. When are we most like God? You know, though we're going to center on the princess of Egypt this morning, this unnamed woman, there, there's another unnamed worm, woman who comes to us in this text, and it's the mother of Moses. In this story, she's unnamed. And do any of you remember reading anything in the Bible about the mother of Moses other than the story of Moses being rescued? This one. One would think a person of such importance, such as Moses, you, you might know a little bit more about his mother. 
But we have to study the genealogy of Moses that is mentioned in one verse. Numbers 26.59 to find out her name. The name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt, and she bore Amram to Amram, Aaron, Moses, and their sister, Miriam. She's an incredible um, champion of our faith because uh, of, of, of her children, namely Moses, and the significance of Moses in life, and that she loved enough to save him. What a wonderful story this is. So I want to rehearse just a little bit of background just to make sure we're all on the same page related to the Moses story. Remember Joseph was part of the royal family. He and his family settled in Egypt. He before they, of course. Uh, you remember Joseph and the coat of many colors and the trouble that got him into. But a generation went by. And both Joseph and the Pharaoh, who was uh, friendly to Joseph, who raised him up into leadership, both of them died. And the new Pharaoh one day noticed uh, that the Hebrew people were as thick as fleas on a dog's back. And, and their population was growing, and this was causing fear in the heart of the Pharaoh. What are we going to do if the Hebrews outnumber the Egyptians? So slowly but surely, Pharaoh began to subjugate the Hebrew people by assisting them, uh, by assigning them more and more work, harder and harder labor. And, and they were feeling more and more oppressed as slaves. Pharaoh thought that it would cause them to quit reproducing if they were having to work so hard and this punishment were was known. But as it turned out, the more they were oppressed, the more they reproduced. And, and so he solicited the help of the midwives who were giving birth to these Hebrew babies. And he told them to terminate every male born. But the midwives feared God. And they wouldn't do it. And when confronted, they blamed the Hebrew women and said that they had their babies before they could actually arrive there. Sounds like an excuse to me. So Pharaoh was both mad and afraid, so he ordered that all Hebrew boys should be thrown in the Nile River the minute those boys were born. Save all the girls, but the boys in the river. So what Jochebed did was to rescue her son. She built a little ark of papyrus and, and reeds, and she covered it with bitumen and, and so that it wouldn't sink. And she made the perfect little ark for this little baby. And she had the perfect little plan. And with her hopes and her prayers, all worked out. The baby's aunt apparently knew how lonely Pharaoh's daughter was. Maybe this aunt worked in the palace. Maybe she worked close uh, to uh, the princess, but, but she knew her emotionally and she knew her patterns in life. She knew when she'd go bathing in the Nile. And so the little baby Moses and the little baby ark was put in the reeds close to where the princess would be, and she discovered it. And as the scripture that was so well read said, when she did, the baby cried, and she had pity on the baby. Pharaoh's daughter found the baby, recognized it as a little Hebrew boy, and decided to raise him herself. And it so happened that her aunt was close by, and she witnessed what had happened. And of course, she spoke up, and, and she said, you're going to need a wet nurse, and I have just the person in mind. Guess who? 
Moses' mother. And before you know it, Moses' own mother is nursing him for Pharaoh's daughter, and she's getting paid. Now, how good could the story get? You know what? Every opportunity she got, Moses' mother would whisper quietly, I can just imagine this, into Moses' ear. And all of those who cared for Moses as he grew up in Pharaoh's palace, they heard the story of the Hebrew people whispered in their, his ear. And Jochebed had saved her baby and played a key role in what God would do to put in motion the salvation of the world. Now, to the character of the story that we want to focus this message on, the daughter of Pharaoh. Let's press the question a little further. At another person who played this significant role in the drama, the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, now we're moving backwards in Scripture, but let's go to verse 5 and 6, and let's see what we have said there in the second chapter. Now, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked beside the river, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to fetch it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and lo, the babe was crying, and she took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Now let's focus on every human dimension of this story that is captured there in this sixth verse. When she opened the ark and she saw the child, the baby was crying and she had pity on the baby. That's what I want to underscore. She had pity on him, on Moses, on the baby. Her curiosity led her to pity. And her pity was changed into compassion. And her compassion overrode pride of race and station and status of who she was. She wanted to be this baby's mother. She wanted to to adopt this little Hebrew boy. And she did. She recognized the problem that that might present in her father's palace. She knew that her father wanted all the little Hebrew boys killed, and this was surely one. But as soon as the infant cried, it touched her heart. Pharaoh's daughter's curiosity that led to pity led to compassion, and became empathy. Empathy. She entered empathetically into the Hebrew experience. Do you hear it? Pity led to compassion that led to empathy. Nothing is more needed in our day, in our world, more than empathy. Moving into the experience of another with the compassion of God. Empathy. Empathy is not just doing for another person. It is that, but it is also feeling with another and experiencing another's pain. Empathy is being able to identify with others and to share their experiences, to laugh when they laugh, to weep when they weep. We are most like God when we have Empathy. 
You know, one of the things that I am ready for as we move past COVID, aren't you ready to move past COVID? I, I hope that we move past COVID, learning some lessons for what, from what that challenging time, more than a year, caused us to engage in. I hope that we as a church, we as a people, you as individuals, will turn up the empathy that is the heart of ministry. And it's lover's lane at our best. Oh, it's not like empathy's been cut, uh, or, or, or cut short here. Uh, empathy has existed, of course, through the COVID era. But some of the things that we were used to doing, which caused us to enter into the experience of another, some of that got put on hold. Now, food ministry is one example that we've talked about a lot, which is an act of empathy that has continued. In fact, it was started because of COVID and the challenges to people related to food scarcity. For over a year, we've been loading fresh produce, rice and beans, sacking it up, and, and then giving it to those who came by here, but not just hand it out. Our volunteers on behalf of each and every one of us have looked into the eyes of those persons who were driving by to pick up their food. They greeted them with a kind word and a blessing. And they have received the sincere thank yous given back to them by these recipients. Prison ministry. We've not been able to enter the prisons as we have for the past 21 years. Every week, we've had teams go into the prisons. At one time, five different prisons. It's thought that Lover's Lane has um, deepened the walk of faith with more than 8,000 incarcerated men and women. I remember one man coming up to me one time that I was down with the Alpha program and he came up to me and he said, you know, Pastor Stan, I want to thank you because Lover's Lane really cares. He was describing empathy. He said other ministries come and go for a weekend here and there. Lover's Lane comes week after week after week after week. And enters into our world. You hear it? It's empathy. And the mission trips. One of the things that I've loved most about ministry at Lover's Lane has been the mission trips and the acts of love that I've experienced. Some with the youth. Building a habitat across town with the occupants of the house. Empathy. Going to Honduras and spending a week on a mountain with the poor, with those who had to be relocated because of a hurricane. And working side by side, the poor of a country, another country. Empathy. Going to Liberia and seeing the hospital that this church and members of this church helped the Wietos to, um, uh, to establish and, and meeting the people of Zoge and being received like a prince. <laughs> Such hospitality. Empathy. Empathy comes from a deliberate identification with another person when we see things as God sees things and we act as God would act. That's the place to which God seeks to bring all of us, all of us, just like he brought Pharaoh's daughter, the Egyptian princess, to empathy. I want to close with a story. This is an unnamed man. Uh, there was a man who 
worked downtown in one of the large northeastern cities of our country. And each day, he rode the commuter train, which went through the lovely suburban home city to him and into the inner city. And the train went through the impoverished areas, of course. That's the way train tracks do, you know. And past the decaying tenements and the dilapidated public housing and the dingy streets. When the train slowed down, uh, this unnamed man could see into these bleak apartments. And when he was especially, um, it was especially slow, he could look into even the bleaker focus of those who entered those drab apartments. He could see the unemployed who were gathered around a fire on a vacant lot, waiting for someone to come by and pick them up for day labor. He could see the children playing on the dusty basketball courts, laying out of school, and he wondered who cared for them. At work, he would often catch himself staring into space, thinking about all of those unnamed people who he had seen in their desperate environment. It became increasingly difficult for him at night to fall asleep because his mind was filled with what he had seen on the train trip. And when he'd close his eyes, he could see those desperate scenes and desperate people. He determined that he had to do something. If he wanted to be productive in work, if he wanted to be able to sleep at night. And so he did. Now, when he rides the commuter train, he pulls down the blind so he doesn't have to look at the people and the depressing environment. He now is at peace. Or is he? Friends, it's not like God to pull down the blinds and not see the people we are called to love. It's like God to see them who they are and where they are. It's like God to hear them, who they are and and, and where they are. It's like God to remember what Jesus calls us to, to love as I have loved. It's like God to want to know them enough to enter their experience. It's like God to be empathetic. Friends, are you ready to get back to church and to turn up the empathy and to see what God will do, not only in the hearts of those we serve, but in our hearts as well? I am. I am. Because empathy is lover's lane at our best. Amen.